the Senator from Texas. Uh, whether the Senator from Texas has received similar comments that I've received from some of my constituents and from other citizens, concerned citizens from around the country in recent months, I'd like to highlight a few of those and ask whether these are familiar with responses that you've heard, concerns that you've heard expressed. Let me start by sharing one uh, expressed by Sean from Utah, who says, quote, I do not like the fact that the president is picking winners and picking and choosing which parts of the law he will enforce. We need the three branches of government to keep freedom alive. Well, Sean from Utah, I share your concern. And I would add to that, Sean from Utah, the fact that this is really what started this effort. In other words, during the first week of July 2013, when the President announced that there were several provisions of the law, he simply would not be implementing, he simply would not be enforcing along the lines of what Congress enacted with the Affordable Care Act in 2010. It was at that point that I, along with several others, put our heads together and realized, you know, if the President's saying that this law is not ready to implement, if the law objectively uh, is not ready to implement. If, as we now understand it, the law is going to make health care less affordable rather than more for so many Americans, uh, perhaps Congress shouldn't be funding its implementation and enforcement. Perhaps that ought to be telling us something. So it is important to remember, as Sean from Utah points out to us, that we do have three branches of government. This is the legislative branch. Our job is to make the laws. The President does not have lawmaking authority. The President can seek changes in the law, just as other citizens can seek them from Congress, but Congress does have to act. And although the President wields the veto pen, the veto pen is not the legislation pen. He doesn't have the power to legislate on his own without the assistance of Congress. It's one of the reasons why we're in this debacle today. It's one of the reasons why we have along with so many millions of Americans, expressed this position that we would like to fund government while defunding Obamacare. Uh, this is something that the American people are calling out for. It's something that they're requesting. It's something that the House of Representatives acted boldly and bravely in doing, in standing behind the American people. And this really is what we're doing. This is the whole reason why we're concerned about this, because we want to stand with the American people and with the House leadership, Speaker Boehner and the other leaders and the other body in Congress that bravely put forward this legislation to keep government funded while defunding Obamacare. One of the things that we have been concerned about today, one of the things that I think we need to focus on in the next few days, is the fact that with the House of Representatives acting last week, passing this legislation, this continuing resolution, to keep government funded while defunding Obamacare. In order for us to stand behind them, we've got to monitor the, monitor the manner in which that legislation is reviewed over here. Now that the House passed continuing resolution has reached the Senate, we've got a few options. There are a few acceptable ways of treating this legislation now that it's been passed by the House. One very acceptable approach would be for us to say, okay, let's, let's bring up the House passed continuing resolution, the resolution that funds government but defunds Obamacare, and let's have an up or down vote. Let's, let's vote for it as is, uh, the, the same way that it was crafted in the House of Representatives. That would be an acceptable approach. Uh, I would be comfortable with that. Another acceptable approach would be to say, Instead of just taking, up, taking it up and, and passing it or not passing it as is, let's have an amendment process. Let's allow Democrats and Republicans, as they may deem fit, to offer up amendments. Let's debate those amendments, discuss their relative merits, their pros and their cons. Let's put those before, uh, before the American people in the few days we have left before the existing continuing resolution expires. And let's vote on all those, and then at the end of it, we'll, we'll get to the bill itself as it may have been amended by that point. That would be acceptable as well. What is not acceptable is what many have suggested will occur. Many have suggested that the majority leader will bring up this bill and instead of saying let's vote on it as is, 
Or instead of saying, let's have an amendment process, he apparently wants to have his cake and eat it too. He wants to have it both ways. He wants to bring it up and subject it to one and only one amendment, an amendment that would strip out a very critical part of the legislation, a part of the legislation that probably is the without which not element for many of the House members who voted for it, the provision defunding Obamacare. He wants that amendment and no other. That's not acceptable. And under that circumstance, in my opinion, and in the opinions of several of my colleagues, some of whom you've heard from today, the appropriate way to register that concern is to vote against cloture on the bill, if in fact that is what the majority leader chooses to do. That's why we're fighting this particular battle today. That's much of what we're discussing today, is why it is that we should not be facilitating the Senate leadership's effort to, in effect, gut the House passed continuing resolution of an extraordinarily critical element, uh, an, an element without which it could never have passed in the House of Representatives, and an element that, frankly, the American people expect us to take up and discuss and debate. So either way, open amendment process, fine. Up or down vote on the bill as is, fine. What's not fine is an effort to try to have it both ways. Let me share with you um, another comment here, a comment that I received by a man named Michael, also from Utah. We're getting a bigger and bigger government. They're telling us what we should have, what we're entitled to, instead of protecting a free people, paving, paving our own path. Government gets bigger while the job market is getting crushed. I work for a company in the middle of layoffs, and more are to follow. We can't continue like this. This is an acknowledgment that so many people across our great country are making as they discover the impact of this bill. Of this bill passed into law some three and a half years ago that has not increased in popularity over the last three years. Time might not have increased its popularity. In fact, it's had quite the opposite effect, but time has had the effect of expanding its volume. It's gone from 2,700 pages when it was passed to more than 20,000 pages now when you add the implementing regulations. That's quite stunning. The length of it is itself quite stunning. It reminds me of something that James Madison wrote. I believe it was in Federalist Number 62. He said, if I may paraphrase him, it will be of little benefit to the American people that their laws may be written by individuals of their own choosing. If those laws are so voluminous and complex that they can't reasonably be read and understood by the American people, well, 2,700 pages is a little too long. It's a lot too long. And I certainly know that 20,000 pages is much, much, much too long. That brings to mind a comment that I received from Marsha, also from Utah, who writes this. However well-intentioned Obamacare may be, I do not feel this is the best solution. I think something less wordy and more succinct would be a much better plan. If you can't say it in five pages or less, it may be best unsaid. The changes already enacted have made it more difficult for me to get medical care, not a big help. Well said, Marsha, and very well said. When we vote on legislation that people haven't read, the American people tend to suffer. When we perpetuate a mistake once made, embodied in a 2,700-page bill, things go from bad to worse to much, much worse. What we have right now is an opportunity for us to debate and discuss the merits of something that perhaps uh, was not adequately debated and discussed three and a half years ago when this law was passed. When members of Congress were told, you have to pass this law to find out what's in it. Well, we know a lot more about what's in it now. The American people have concerns. And it's appropriate that we have the discussion now in connection with spending legislation. Because after all, Congress does have the power of the purse. Congress is given this power, this responsibility of making decisions regarding taxing and spending. 
It was for this reason that the founding generation wisely put into the hands of the House of Representatives the power of the purse, giving the House of Representatives the responsibility to initiate or originate uh, bills relating to this power. It's the House of Representatives that is, after all, the branch of government, the end of Congress, that is most directly responsive to the needs of the people. And it's appropriate that we have this discussion as we're talking about funding or not funding. A piece of legislation that is going to require a lot of money and is going to be proving costly to the American people in many, many ways in the coming years. And I say costly in many ways uh, to reflect the fact that it's not just that it costs the government money. It costs the American people a lot of things as, as well. It's costing them jobs. It's costing them wages. It's costing them access to health care in many, many circumstances. Let me read you uh, something that I received from Randy. Randy's from my neighboring state of Idaho. Randy writes, my wife and I have a small business with about 20 employees. We struggle to stay in business. We feel that if and when Obamacare is implemented, we will not be able to continue to be in business. Randy, I can't tell you how many people I've heard make very similar comments. From one end of my state, of Utah, to the other, and from people across America. You're not alone, Randy. A lot of people out there are concerned as well. That's one thing people lose in addition to wages or jobs or access to health care. Some of them lose the opportunity that they have to stay in business. We're not talking about millionaires and billionaires. We're talking about hardworking Americans who have put a lot on the line in order to make a decent living, in order to provide jobs for their few employees. Uh, this is something we need to look out for. This is something that we may not, we must not lightly brush aside. Here's something else that some Americans will sometimes lose, something that they were promised that they would not lose, access to a doctor that they like, access to a doctor that they've come to trust over the years. This one comes from Jack of the state of Texas. Jack says, my family doctor of 25 years is talking about an early retirement because policies Obamacare is going to require him to follow that will compromise the oath he took when he became an MD. This is sad, Jack. This is something that we were promised would not happen. Uh, this is something that should not happen. Uh, this is something that we're told is happening from time to time. Ryan, also of Texas, writes, my mother is a middle-class mortician whose health care coverage is going up by 68 percent for this poorly envisioned law with no other changes. She simply cannot afford to maintain health care coverage without significant changes to her lifestyle. And for what? Sometimes we have to, have to ask that question, and for what? Sometimes we have to ask the question, the same question that physicians are required to ask themselves, are we doing harm? It's my understanding that when a phys physician becomes licensed, he or she must take an oath, an oath that involves an obligation to first do no harm. We as lawmakers have to ask ourselves that question from time to time. We as lawmakers have to view ourselves as subject to a similar obligation to first do no harm. You know, some have said that when you're carrying around a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail. And I wonder whether that is sometimes true of Congress and the lawmaking power. Because of the lawmaking power that we wield, sometimes when we view problems, we assume that we automatically, necessarily, inevitably have the right solution. Well, in some cases that may be true. In other cases, it might be true in part but that power might be used incorrectly. Sometimes when legislation is hastily drafted, thrown together in a hurry, rather than for purposes of making sure that it's part of a cohesive whole, something that will be a, a coherent mechanism that can be implemented in a common sense fashion. Sometimes if it's thrown together too hastily and these cautions are ignored, 
we can end up doing a lot of harm. We can find ourselves first doing harm uh, above all else, and that's not okay. When we look at this law, and we look at the fact that the American people are funding its implementation, we discover that it's much deeper than something that deals with an individual mandate or an employer mandate or a set of regulations governing the insurance industry. It's much, much more than that. It's much more than what people will have to do with regard to the reporting of some fairly personal details about their lives to the IRS, an agency that Americans have come to trust substantially less than they already did, as if that were possible. It's about the fact that the American people, in addition to being made less free by this law, in addition to being made less prosperous by this law, are also required to fund its implementation and its enforcement against them. That's where the power of the purse must come into play. That's what makes it so appropriate, so essential, so vital that we have this discussion right here and right now as we consider spending legislation, spending legislation that may well represent our last best hope of achieving a degree of delay or defunding of this legislation before its primary operative provisions take full effect. That's why it's important for us to have this discussion right now. And let me emphasize again the importance of the cloture vote and the position that we're taking on that. It is grounded fundamentally in the understanding that the House of Representatives acted in a manner consistent with what the American people have been asking. And I, I can't emphasize enough the fact that House Speaker John Boehner and his leadership team in the House, the House Republicans who supported him in this effort, they did great work. They stood valiantly with the American people who were calling out overwhelmingly for them to take this step to keep government funded but defund Obamacare. And that's what they did. Now that they have acted, there are two approaches we could take to this that are perfectly appropriate. We could vote on that legislation as is, up or down. Or we could subject it to an amendment process, allow Democrats and Republicans alike to present amendments to make the House passed resolution better as they might deem fit. We can debate and discuss and vote on each of those. Sure, it can be time consuming. Sure, it can be grueling. But that's our job. We took an oath to do that job. And you know, we do this all the time. Maybe not as much as we should, but just a few months ago, in connection with the budget resolution, we as senators stood and sat, a little while both, here all night long. We voted all night long until five, six o'clock in the morning. People got a little cranky at times, but you know, that's what we're here to do, not to be cranky, but we're here to vote, to cast votes on amendments. And that's what we had to do that day because there were a lot of amendments. That's what we should be doing with this if in fact we decide we want amendments to the House passed resolution. So vote on it, up or down as is, fine. Subject it to an open amendment process, fine. Trying to have it both ways. The majority leader telling us this will be subject to one amendment, one amendment only, an amendment that would gut and render nugatory the operative provision that was so important to so many House members. That's not okay. That's why those who agree with us on this point, those who feel that way, those who feel that the American people need us to stand up for them, should vote no on cloture when we get to cloture on the bill later in this week. And so I would ask my colleague from Texas, these concerns that I've expressed, these statements that have been made from people around the country, some of them my constituents in Utah, uh, some of them from other parts of the country, including a couple from Texas. What similarities do you see between these statements that I've read today and comments that you've heard from your constituents as you've traveled your great state uh, a state of great expanse and, and a state of uh, uh, close to 30 million people. What similarities do you see between these statements and those that you've heard around your state? I thank my friend.